and welcome to Japan Expert Insights and our Japanese Politics 101 room. Every Sunday, Timothy Langley, who runs a company in Tokyo that focuses exclusively on Japanese politics, government and public affairs, and host by Matsuoka, bring to you the latest developments in Japanese politics. In this podcast, we welcome comments, questions and opinions, so if you haven't done so yet, join us next time. In the meantime, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific region. Today, we are going to talk about the supplementary budget, the children's agency, COVID, and what's going on inside of the LDP. Timothy, the floor is yours. I think I heard from you last week after the show. You said that you were... Uh, talking from uh, Yokohama last week, right? That's right. So last week they, I had an event that I couldn't escape from. And yeah. so I had to um, do the show from the backseat of my car. Yes. And I know that you're not going to say that in front of everybody. So I'll say it for you. So, oh. Yes. So to everybody, uh, just I want to officially announce here. Well, that... look, wait, wait, before you do so. <laughs> You, you announced in our room last week that I'm, I'm at this event and it was with Rolls Royce and Bentley owners yes. and Akalenga and uh, Cole is in the room now and also Todd um, and they both showed up and yes. us were about seven people or eight people from our clubhouse room who showed up last week. So it was really, um, really fantastic to see people there. Well, I'm very happy to know that. So everybody wants to meet the star. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So, and let me say um, that instead of you, that uh, I'm happy to officially announce that Timothy Langley's car won yeah. the Car of the Year prize last week at the Ak yes, Akarenga event of um, the Rolls Rolls and Bentley owners. So this is an yearly event, isn't it? It's an annual event. Yes. And it's amazing that um, my car, because there were, there were 60 cars there, two of them were more than 100 years old. And there were just like really nice, beautiful cars there. And mine is kind of by comparison, rather um, uh, n normal, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I guess because uh, Todd showed up and Cole showed up, they thought, wow, that, that must be the car of the year. So thank you very much, guys, for showing up. Thanks, thanks very much, Maya. Every week something happens and it's enough to fill, fill a room with enough uh, insight and um, uh, just you know, brightness about how things happen and why things happen the way that they do, that, um, you know, we're able to, to have this show. This is our 41st uh, consecutive week. Is that right, Maya? Mm -hmm. So um, 42nd. There, there, 42nd, my gosh. So there, there is something to this and it's not um, obtruse. It's not, you know, hidden. It's, it is meaningful. So I, I really appreciate people, um, you know, continuing to, to sign in on the show. As you remember last week when I, I, um, uh, had this um, briefing with you um, from the backseat of my car while parked at Akalenga. We talked about um, the LDP and the construction of the LDP, the factions, the seven factions that make it up. Um, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, what's going on with the, the Kishida administration and who's on top and who's on the bottom. Uh, we talked about the opposition leaders and who, who is, um, who, who, who are making up the, the opposition. There's a, one, the main opposition party is the Constitutional Democratic Party. And their leader resigned because they had such a poor showing in the last election. So we talked about that in the election that they're going through. We went into a little bit of geopolitics um, and uh, I um, boosted uh, Dr. Stephen Nagy's show, who, which will be this Monday night. Isn't that right, Maya? Tomorrow night, yes. So he focuses uh, exclusively on geopolitics. Weeks ago, he talked uh, mostly about India. Um, and so uh, I, I don't talk too much about geopolitics unless it's just really specifically Japan related, but he is actually uh, much more eloquent and, and uh, more deeply seeped in that. Um, but we did talk a little bit about what was going on with the uh, Biden Z uh, telephone conference last week and the US, Japan, Korea, South Korea talks that kind of fell apart. Um, and the United States was the only party that showed up for their press briefing. Um, we talked about uh, travel and quarantine, the go-to travel, um, the LDP um, uh, winning basically the, the last election coming out on top, doing particularly well, and some of the factions that didn't do well. 
Um, and then um, I, I tied it up by just going through each of the individual factions and talking about them, their leadership, their composition, and uh, what kind of coalitions that they have been building since the election. So that continues to today. Um, but I'd like to start the conversation today by just talking about the biggest thing that happened last week, and that was the passage of the supplemental budget. So um, the reason why um, the supplemental budget is is important to us and to this audience. So this audience is uh, comprised largely of people who are working with uh, trade, uh, foreign capital companies, diplomacy, that sort of thing. So the things that we we tend to focus on are those areas that uh, impact us. And the the idea is to give you insight and tools and and um, uh, information about what's going to happen that you can predict and you can help your whoever your clients are, your boss or your company or whatever your your line of business is in the short to medium term because things happen. And this supplemental budget is supplemental to the budget that was passed last year until April. So whatever money that they pass in the supplemental budget is supposed to be spent between now and April. So that's huge. So things are going to happen as a consequence of that. That means money is injected into the system fairly quickly. And so the size of it and what people say about it are keenly important. So you just need to, to kind of key in on those, those areas. So initially, um, analysts had predicted, this is um, uh, before the Kishida um, uh, election, well, actually around the Kishida election, and then before the election of the um, lower house. But they were talking about, um, you know, a, a, a range of about, you know, 30 to 40 trillion um, yen. Uh, as a supplemental budget. And then as we approached the elections, all of a sudden it started to escalate. And um, in order to encourage voters, the LDP uh, was speaking very elaborately and expansively about what the budget would be and how they're going to help pay for COVID and how people are going to get money. And Komeito came up and said, we're going to give everybody, you know, uh, 100,000 yen so that you can help your children and just things like that. They were just promoting themselves in the... Um, in the election to be, you know, more um, electable than who, whoever their competition might be. And it turns out now that although the prediction was 30 to 40 trillion, it, it now ends up being 55.7 trillion stimulus package. So that's, um, that's orgasmic. That is, um, that is just so surprising. It's the, the many of the analysts um, are remarking that it was kind of shock and awe. This is, this is to grab people's attention and to show them that the Kishida administration means what it says and it's, it's going to give everybody money and the economy is going to turn around and we're going to crush COVID. So those are the underlying um, um, essences of, of what they did. They, they were pressured, instead of having such a large stimulus, to reduce the consumption. Remember, we went from 8% to 10%. And there was a, a lot of voices that said, why don't you just lower the consumption? back down to 8% or maybe even 5% for a period of time. That's going to help everybody. They passed on that, but they um, they came up with different, um, uh, not schemes, but ways of paying for it. They issued another um, $31 trillion worth of bonds that will um, increase once again the debt. So issuing bonds just means more debt to, uh, to the economy, and the Japanese economy is already saddled by the most tremendous amount of debt of any of the uh, – uh, OEDC uh, countries, so it's 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 an issue. They're just kicking the ball down the um, down the field. Somebody else will take care of it. But um, one of the things that uh, the Kishi administration is committed to, there are a couple of things. And so, if you're in these areas or if you're looking for uh, business, uh, you need to pay attention. One of them is you know decarbonization of the economy. He's committed to that. Um, I think it was a little bit stronger under the Abe administration. But uh, that continues even without the leadership of uh, Konotaro in that in that area. But it is an area that um, they are devoting a lot of money. The other thing is that he speaks about this in a kind of a spiritual way, the income disparity and the redistribution of wealth. People scratch their heads when they hear him say that because he hasn't quite figured out how to do it. But he has put up um, several um, groups to tackle that, and they consist of – the right kinds of people that should be in that. And he's, he's heading up uh, one of them. So rather than um, uh, initiating new, um, new policies or setting up new administrations, he's setting up uh, particular uh, groups, uh, 
not quite study groups, but um, like councils. And he's sitting on one of them just to show that um, it's it's very important to him that, that he gets this done, this redistribution of wealth. The K. Don Ren has already come out and said, we are opposed to hiking wages. You know, you think, gosh, that's, um, that's kind of unkind for K. Don Ren to say that because it's, it's long been uh, said that the, the, the rate of, of wage increases in this country has um, hampered the, the economy from taking off and it would be boosted by having uh, wages re readjusted, especially for cost of living. That hasn't happened in, in such a long time and it doesn't look like it's going to happen uh, with K. Dunren's help. But um, Mr. Kishida also has some tools in his pocket. He has said that he will reward certain uh, companies and industries if they do increase wages to have access to funds or um, uh, stimulus packages, that sort of thing. So I think we can see some movement there, especially as we approach April. But uh, that just, uh, I think we have to wait around for that a little bit. But it is being uh, um, kicked around. So right now they passed that supplemental budget. That's a pretty big deal. And now that they, um, they've done that, they will have a, uh, a diet session in December. So December, today's the 20. Eighth, right? Today's the 28th. Yeah. So in two or three days, it'll be uh, the December and there will be a diet session at that point, an extraordinary diet session where they will debate the pluses and minuses of the supplemental budget. And then they'll close out the year and they won't have a diet session until uh, uh, January. It will be a, a normal diet session, 141 days, and we'll be back in business. So as, as that begins to roll out, um, you will see um, lots of things going on inside Japanese politics. So there's a shift going on now. You've got Mr. Kishida as the prime minister. Mr. Aso is lined up with him. Mr. Motegi is lined up with him. And on the other side, you've got Mr. Nikai, Mr. Suga, who have been kind of bruised and kind of pushed aside, but they're still in the game. They're still playing there. And you've got Mr. Abe, the number one, uh, the leader of the number one largest, who is kind of dancing in between. So he's going to be kind of like a, um, uh, what would you call it, a, um, uh, a game breaker? Uh, he can shift his alliance depending on what the issue is. He has it. He's not in one camp or the other. Um, I think uh, Kishida won as a consequence of Mr. Aso and, and Motegi and some of the things that happened. We all are, are a bit familiar with that. Um, he was instrumental in splitting that vote so that Konotaro didn't become prime minister, but Kishida did. But it still seems like he's a little bit not quite in the in group. Um, so I think you'll see him playing more of a spoiler role. Um, as we as we move forward, and he's um, he's busy, uh, you know, shoring up his his forces as well. Uh, you can see um, as as news rolls out, keep keep your eye on uh, people who are shifting alliances or um, maybe even uh, shifting um, into different factions. I think you'll see a little bit of faction movement over the next coming months. Shifting gears, you remember um, soon after uh, Mr. Suga launched the. A digital agency very successfully launched it in a year. He actually launched it in, in a couple of months. Um, the LDP came up with an idea. Let's have a children's agency because um, it shows our, our kinder, more gentler side. So we need to to boost our image and let's let's focus on the children. And so they, they floated that up and they put a lot of effort into it. And they just announced this last week that it's a little bit too much for us. We're going to we're going to push that one back. So the idea of having the uh, children's agency has um, been uh, put on hiatus. And the reason for that, and I actually predicted it, that you know, this was mostly for a, um, a uh, election ploy to, to get people to like the LDP more because they're not the money grubbers that you think they are. You know, they're actually um, concerned about your issues and your welfare, and, and they're more like uh, Komeito than the LDP of old. Um, it turns out that that's not quite the case. And the reason... They said that they can't quite tackle the children's issues because of the vertical divisions. So many um, other ministries are in charge of uh, dealing with children, including the police with domestic violence, health and welfare, the education ministry, um, and the, the cabinet office also has a slice of that. So that's the reason why we're going to ditch the children's agency. But when you actually step back and look at it, the digital agency is far more intrusive and involves far more of vertical divisions than what the children's agency is. So you have to scratch your head and wonder why this thing was floated in the first place and now all of a sudden why it is canceled. It's just um, an observation that I'd like to make and, and share with you. I'd like to move on to COVID. So there's a lot going on with COVID. You've heard about the uh, travel advisories for 
uh, seven nations in Africa. So the United States uh, announced um, uh, travel advisories, no travel from um, uh, these countries starting tomorrow, starting Monday. Um, and um, also travel advisories for, uh, I believe it's uh, Germany and Denmark. So there's an awful lot going on there. There's a lot of um, uh, confusion, political confusion and protests. Um, and also the numbers are starting to peak there. So there's a travel advisory that has been issued there too. There's a new virant, a, a variant that's out. You've heard about that. And so this next week, I think you'll see a lot of, a lot of reports, a lot of maybe panic reporting that this new wave is coming and it's coming. It's going to be more vir virulent and more dangerous. Um, you can expect to hear that um, coming uh, pretty, pretty soon. Um, this next week is going to be very heavy with that. The election for the, uh, you remember Mr. Edano, the uh, leader of the Constitutional Democratic Party, resigned as a consequence of the election, uh, the poor showing for his party. And the reason why, um, the main reason pointed to why they did so poorly was because he concocted an idea that in those areas where they don't have a candidate or a candidate that's likely to win, that they concede before the election and then they support um, one of their other, one of the other opposition parties, just so they can get the LDP out. So if it's, if it's not going to be me, let it be, uh, the other guy who is in, in the opposition, just so the LDP doesn't get any stronger. And the opposition party that they chose to hold hands with was the, was the Japan communist party. That didn't turn out so well. And it, it turned people off the people who were in the communist party who didn't have a viable candidate and were told to vote for the uh, constitutional democratic party thought, you know, what the hell? I don't, I don't know this guy. I don't like him. I don't like that. It doesn't, it doesn't ring true to me. And similarly with the, the Constitution Democratic Party, the, the Japanese Communist Party is very well organized. It's very thick. I think they run a candidate in almost every election, whether they win or not. And the idea with the Constitutional Democratic Party was, we know that you're going to run a candidate. He's unlikely to win. So rather than running that candidate, back off a little bit in, in, in those regions where you have a chance, except for our running a candidate, we'll back off so that you can win a candidate. That didn't quite work. And as a consequence, Mr. Edeno resigned, and there are four people in his, um, in his party. Now, his party went from 110 to 96. Not huge, but it's, it's enough to um, uh, make him resign. The four new candidates um, each have come up with their own policy what they stand for, what they want the Constitutional Democratic Party to uh, represent. And their election will be on Tuesday, this Tuesday coming up. Um, so that's um, creating a lot of interest. It's like when the LDP was going for uh, the election of their president. It was great for the LDP because it allowed the candidates to talk about the LDP. They talked about themselves too. But in the absence of having anything else to talk about for the opposition parties, the LDP uh, sucked in all the oxygen and people learned more about the LDP, what it meant. And similarly with the Constitutional Democratic Party through these last uh, 12 days, we've been, uh, it has been revealed to us what the Constitutional Democratic Party actually believes, you know, what they, what, the, what their views are on the revision of the Constitution, they're actually for it. How they feel about the U.S. bases in Okinawa, they're against it. Um, what they feel about, you know, the supplemental budget and um, the, the funds given to, uh, you know, college age and younger children. So um, it, it's been a, a great education for the population. Unfortunately, what they have decided is that this idea of um, collaborating with the Japan Con uh, Communist Party is a good one and we should continue to pursue that. All four of these candidates supported that position. So even though Edeno fell on his sword as a result of the, um, the election and the election came out because of this strategy, all four of the candidates have endorsed it as the, the policy that we should continue to pursue. So that's really interesting. We've got less than seven months before the next election of the uh, one half of the upper house. So that's going to be very contentious and people are already um, lining up for it. Finally, I'd like to talk about the LDP and uh, what's going on with the opposition there. So we talked earlier about, you know, Motegi and uh, Aso and Kishida being on one division and Nikai and Suga being on the other division. So these things are beginning to actually um, form into demonstrable blocks. So there was a, a visit by um, uh, Vietnam 
just this last week, and Nikai and uh, Suga hosted uh, the delegation. And so you can begin to see, even in foreign policy, um, they're trying to uh, carve out a poll position in certain issues. And probably, um, given the, the, the vastness of what's going on with China, um, TPP, and all of these, these trade and, and related issues, that the LDP will probably relinquish some control and some um, uh, discretion to these, um, because they're LDP factions as well. So, th you know, they, you have to give them a, a bit of the bone because otherwise the frustration uh, begins to drive up. But don't give them a bone that's going to give them more power when the, uh, when the election comes through. So you have to keep people happy. You have to keep them kind of quiet. Mr. Um, Abe is, is being uh, rather um, out of the news these last two weeks. Um, but I don't think that's because he's licking his wounds. I think that's just because he's preparing for, for other and bigger things. There's a lot to be um, to, to look forward to. We're entering to the end of the year. We'll have uh, one more extraordinary uh, budget uh, diet meeting uh, probably in, within the next two weeks. It'll be very brief, maybe three days, four days, and then we'll close it up for the year. Um, there are other things that are going on, but let me just um, wrap it up there. I've been, I think, talking long enough open the room. There are other people who are uh, very familiar with what's going on, maybe have better insight than I do on some of these things. And anyway, it's just great. It's the best part of, uh, of this briefing to have other people come into the room and, um, you know, engender a, uh, a conversation on these issues. Thank you very much. Maya, thank you for giving me the time. I got a question via the back channel. So it is um, okay from Catherine from the University of uh, Malaya. And uh, she's from the Strategic and Defense Studies Department there. So she says, um, recently, as Japan and China and Taiwan are actively joining CPTTP, may I know your opinion on how you think US and Japan will boycott China's participation? So I realize that this is a question which may be better, po better asked uh, uh, to Stephen Nagy tomorrow. But uh, just uh, what's your opinion now? That's a, a great question. I think the question that she ends up with, as she, as Kat, as you you formed the the preamble of your question, led me to a different direction. Then you came up with the the question: Is is Japan and the United States going to boycott the Olympics? There there are really two big issues here. One is the um, uh, the formal TPP. Everybody remembers the TPP, and when uh, Trump became president. He says, you know, America first. I'm not going to join this. This is a, this is a, a, a rigged game, and the United States is going to be on the loser, loser side. I don't want to have any part of it. So he pulled out. And the, um, the countries um, are still kind of in discussions about launching this, this uh, trade uh, region. And it was essentially built up to thwart the enormous power of China. And so it consisted of, you know, all of the, the United States allies and people who wanted to protect the, uh, you know, the Taiwan Straits and, and freedom of shipping and, and that sort of thing. And it turned into a, a different kind of organ. It, it turned into the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is still going on. Biden hasn't come back and said, I want to be, I want to rejoin that. Although there are lots of discussions going on that. Kirk Campbell is on that uh, pretty hard too. Um, but as it stands right now, the United States isn't a part of it. But guess who wants to be a member? China. China is really lobbying to try and be in this. So this this whole idea of building a, a bulwark against China um, aggression now is it looks like it could be uh, taken over or at least joined by by China. And that would be uh, wouldn't that be uh, like a kick in the teeth? You know, after all of the, the effort and you know, the years that have been put into um, figuring out how we do, you know, barter trade and make trade, you know, easy and uh, uh, consistent with uh, regular rules and, and, and taxation, that sort of thing. And in light of that, you've got um, these just incredible advances by China in uh, hypersonic uh, weaponry and um, the, the missile technology that has come out over the last two months. It's, um, it's really taken, uh, you know, defense departments by surprise. There's, there's a lot of concern for that. And what this kind of uh, builds up to, if you if you roll this out, if if this pace of, of development begins to um, uh, continue, and the United States is unable to 
to confront it. You know, the United States-Japan relationship is based on, you know, this nuclear umbrella that the United States provides. And if it turns out that that has now become ineffective and inefficient to deal with the new uh, defense capabilities, the relationship between the United States and Japan, the foundation of that, the nuclear umbrella, um, begins to uh, falter. At the same time, you've got the, the Japanese, many, many Japanese wanting to revise the Constitution. It looks like that that will be a referendum that could be launched this year, very seriously, um, because you've got a, a, enough um, of the, the political parties who have said that they would um, be in, in, in favor of a constitutional revision, including the Constitutional Democratic Party, the largest opposition party, the LDP, of course. And um, Ishin, Ishin, who, who did a, a, extremely well in the last election, going from 10 to 40, 41 um, new diet seats. So um, that is a supermajority in the uh, lower house. Um, with the election in the upper house asking for a referendum, you could see that happening uh, pretty quickly. So the, the distinction or the differentiate differentiation of Japan with a peace constitution compared to Japan with um, forward-looking offensive capabilities is just so huge. It is so huge to um, consider uh, geopolitically. So that looks like that might be coming down the path too. So these are those issues that um, Kat's initial question uh, guided to me. And then she asked, you know, is the United States going to boycott the, uh, the Winter Olympics, which is a completely different um, discussion because it's, it's rather imminent. My... Um, my impression is that um, they, the, the United States is not going to boycott um, via athletes, but they might boycott um, the games diplomatically, meaning they wouldn't send uh, political representatives. They wouldn't send uh, Joe Biden or his wife or any of the, the foreign dignitaries uh, as attending, but uh, they wouldn't prevent the, the athletes from going. And the only reason why it might um, reach a level of full uh, boycott is, um, I think, if um, if new news came out about COVID, that um, and, and there is there is a lot of evidence out there. It hasn't really coalesced into a, a um, an accusation, a formal accusation. But if something comes out, then it, it could end up into a uh, a huge boycott for China. So uh, that's not happening in a vacuum. The the Chinese are doing their best to um, to guide that public opinion as well. But I hope that responds somewhat to your excellent question, Kat. Last week you mentioned that if it happens, it will be probably uh, because of uh, new variants and COVID and so on. But yeah, let's see what happens really because things change all the time. And it's interesting because the other day on Friday, I actually listened to a presentation by Kay Dan Ren uh, about um, you know how uh, the Federation intends to support the economy and move forward. And, Kei Danren is the Japan Business Federation. They are basically considered uh, to be the think tank of uh, industry development, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the business development here in Japan. And um, so um, it's, I'm going back to your um, <coughs> uh, point about COVID. Timothy, you mentioned that uh, it's going to be a big topic probably next week here in Japan as well. And I'm just seeing one watching, uh, sorry, looking at one of their uh, slides now. And Kay Danren is firmly set to not, um, or to lobby, let's say, for no limitations for, um, you know, getting out of the houses or, you know, self-restraint and so on, even though, even if there is a new variant, which is, uh, uh, you know, which is just emerging right now. So it is interesting to see how it will play out too, <sighs> because, uh, yes, obviously the politicians and Kay Danren, they have... Uh, uh, goals which overlap, but they come from different perspectives anyway. And Ren, good morning. Good morning, uh, Maya. Good morning, Timothy. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, I have a I have a couple of questions here. Um, when I heard um, Timothy mentioned um, the diplomatic boycott versus the uh, um, the athlete uh, boycott mm -hmm. uh, from the U.S., I think uh, that's what. Uh, uh, President Biden said, or the, his administration said. Right. And I saw an article um, in Japan that uh, a, a high-ranking Japanese government official, I forgot his name, is it um, some kind of uh, advisor to prime minister? Uh, he was asked by the media about 
what he thought about uh, President Biden's uh, or his administration's plan to inv uh, to to evaluate the possibility of a diplomatic uh, boycott. Uh, his answer was, well, uh, Japan has, uh, I think he said something like Japan has, uh, Japan's way of doing this, we're not going to just follow what Americans do. I think that's what he said. Do you remember that, that article, uh, that, that things? Uh, yeah. Democracy? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So my question is, what, what exactly is Japan's own thinking, right? Uh, is it that, that did he mean, did he mean, uh, Jiminto, uh, or did he mean the Japanese government? Or did he mean he speaks for Japanese people? Or uh, I was a little bit confused about what he meant by Japan's way of Japan's unique way of doing this. A any any hint you can provide, uh, or any thoughts, or your own opinion? Uh, I would be very interested in hearing what you what you might say. Thank you. Great question. So we have these um, these fellows that are affiliated with the Japanese government without being the Japanese government, so they can say things either on their own volition or they can be asked to say them and they're essentially trial balloons when the japanese government asks them to say something it's a trial balloon they watch what kind of reaction it generated and then they revise accordingly but also they're um in in the area of the japanese government asking some of these advisors who don't speak for the japanese government but they happen to be an advisor so they people you know rightly assume that they carry some weight their voice carries weight and when they are asked to um, to say something like that, it is almost always in conjunction with something else going on in the background. So there's some some difficulty that they're having in some area that's unrelated to, for example, uh, the Olympic Games. But if the, if the United States wants to make their message clear, and it sure would be nice if all of the allies also diplomatically boycotted. So that means that we're kind of this is a signal we're trying to send not just by the United States, but by all of these, you know, nations of freedom, these the, these democracies of the world, we're, we're sending a signal. If there is a cohesion there, then our message is, is much stronger. So there's horse trading that goes on there. You know, we would like, you know, the, um, the United States to, um, you know, relinquish a little bit of the control that you have on, you know, whatever, uh, COVID passports or oil prices or something else, it's always related to something else, then I think we would be accommodating on that other one. So I think that's it because um, the diplomatic, I think the diplomatic solution is, it's a rather soft touch. It's still being um, angry. It's, it's sending a signal, but you know, at least the athletes are still there. You can kind of paper over the fact that um, Joe Biden didn't come to the Olympic games or, or send in any of his, uh, his representatives. You can kind of overlook that as long as the games still continue on. But that's that's my my view of it. Yes, thank you. I I am um, I'm now a little bit confused. I'm, I may be confusing myself. I think I thought I was speaking about a person called Nakatani Hosakan, but I now think that was actually not him. He was actually from Hayashi San, the foreign minister. If the, yeah. if if you were from uh, Hayashi foreign minister, who says that. He does represent the the majority of the uh, Jiminto's opinion, or not? Yeah. Okay. What do you think? Yeah. Now, he he his ministry would be in charge of the, the who gets to go to the Olympics to represent uh, Japan. Um, I suspect um, it, it came out of Gen Nakatani's uh, ad, um, advisor, and unless you're, you're saying it, it came out of the actual voice of the foreign minister or. Uh, again, Nakatani, who, who does represent the Japanese government in terms of human rights abuse. And it sounds that like something like that would come out of Gen Nakatani rather than Hayashi. Hayashi has to be much more um, careful in the words that he says. I see. Well, thank you. And, and if I uh, might, if I may ask another question, I know I took out a lot of time already here. Please go no, ahead. No problem. No problem. Uh, thank you. Um, it's also uh, it's also about, uh, about what you said um, that triggered my question about the, uh, the, the, the uh, supersonic missiles from China and, you know, the U.S. Yeah. Um, uh, is my voice breaking up? Are you guys okay? No. It's not okay. Um, so my question is, um, you know, there was a talk, there was a, there was a talk about uh, Japan's raising the percentage of the GDP of the defense spending to at least match uh, right. EU's. Yeah. Uh, do you know what's the latest, latest status on that, um, Timothy? 
the last I heard was what was what you heard. Um, um, there was a discussion just this last week about doubling um, the amount that's dedicated to uh, self-defense forces. Um, I think that that can still happen without a constitutional revision, without having offensive capabilities. But I think um, it's anticipation and preparation for that. I think um, almost unmistakably, Japan is moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. As the United States begins to uh, waver a little bit, and these these incredible advances by the, the Chinese in um, advanced weaponry, and, and we don't know what the United States has. I mean, they've, they've launched Space Force, so who knows what they have uh, out there and um, all of the, the things that we just don't know about. But I think there is a pause for concern that Japan needs to be able to stand on its own feet without reliance on the United States, that the nuclear umbrella had its heyday, and maybe we're moving into a, a new um, new era, and Japan needs to you know, be able to defend itself. I think, well, that's, a, that's a, tough, a tough call, because even if that's their decision, China is so huge and, and so advanced that uh, it's going to take Japan generations and generations to have a viable defense to that, not even to, um, to accommodate it as a, as a peer. It's, it's, it's just too big. So <clears throat> if, if you're uh, a Japanese national, you're thinking, <clears throat> are, are we safer under a peace constitution so that uh, we're, we're prevented from, hopefully, from being attacked because why would somebody attack us? Or do we have to ha be armed to the teeth so that the deterrence of attacking us is so great? Uh, and that's that's where we, um, you know, that's we spend our money on on advanced weaponry and uh, defensive and offensive capabilities. It's a tough call. Yeah, that sounds like Switzerland, right? Um, during the World War Two, the, the, yeah, the Hitler knew um, the Nazis knew they can take over Switzerland, but it's painful. Why would you do that kind of you know deterrence? Right, that's, right. that's the most you can do. Um, I I would. Uh, um, I guess I, I'm curious to know um, whether. Uh, okay, let me step, take one. Uh, let, let me take one step. One, one step back. Um, there's a talk, There's a there's a uh, mentality among the Japanese people. I think. I think uh, that uh, anybody who talks about spending more on the the national defense uh, is considered a right wing or the hoax. Um, uh, personally, I, I I think if you're, you know, motivating your 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 nationals or your people to attack another country, then that is certainly a right wing or hoax. But uh, just to increase your defensive uh, capability, and uh, I don't think it's it's you know, I mean, if your if your father is trying to protect your house from an, an, an intruder, you should be proud of your father fighting for for your family. Right? I don't think that's considered. The right wing or uh, uh, extremists, but I have a feeling. I have had the feeling that uh, it is viewed that way. Uh, so, is it the main or the sentiment, the main reason uh, Japan cannot get to the same level of national spending and uh, national defense spending as Europe, uh, EU at least? What What is the number one uh, reason that is? preventing from Japan as a country to go into or implement that plan as quickly as possible. As you know, the timing is very sensitive now. That's a, that's a great question. It, it probably uh, requires a book to address. But I think you, you talked about Switzerland and, and uh, the invasion by, uh, by uh, Germany. In that situation, the Swiss never did anything against Germany to generate animosity or, or even hatred. It was just geopolitical. Um, in the situation with Japan, um, we had um, a long, long period. I mean, World War II was only just the culmination of, of 30 years of, of Japan expansionism in Southeast Asia. And so there is this, um, it's not really quite hidden, but this animosity, it, it seems like um, those wounds have, have for, for many, have never healed in Japan being the third largest economy in the world. Now people are looking at that and saying, I mean, some people are saying, um, you know, that's because, you know, you, you broke our backs to, to crawl up and that's why you're, you're number three. You owe us, you know, you guys, what you did 
was so terrible, so unforgivable. We don't care that the war is over. You still need to pay reparations. You still need to take care of the women that you raped and the the uh, the people that you slaughtered. So that that sentiment is still there, and I think that that plays very heavily on the Japanese psyche on in two levels. One is. What the hell did you guys get us into? You militarists, you got us into this war and we got bombed and, and look at the suffering that everybody had to do. You sons of bitches, you know. And on the other side, you know, you've got people who are who are proud of the heritage that, you know, they almost made it. They uh, they could have been a, a dominant force in, in world politics and, and um, you know, been even greater than they are right now. So there's that, that huge tension. And I, I think Japan hasn't hasn't really fully not just japan but the whole region hasn't quite come to terms with it we, we see that all the time the the the, the summit meeting with um the uh, uh foreign ministers in um in uh, washington uh two weeks ago uh, just kind of collapsed japan south korea and the united states there's still a lot going on there and we're allies talk about you know somebody who's not allies like china there is a real animosity you remember the um, the piece that was written that um, uh, they said that they will take Japan, they will carve it up, they will divide it into four different uh, regions, they'll be dominated by China if you guys don't, um, you know, let us do whatever we want to do with, with Taiwan. And that that time, that that uh, come to Jesus call, is it's approaching. It's, it's going to be here within the next 10 years. Thank you. So, <laughs> so Timothy, uh, the bottom line is uh, yes, it's that. Uh, I guess your answer is, is to me is yes. The bottom line is of that history, uh, that uh, negative legacy, if you will, uh, is the one that is preventing Japanese government to implement that uh, increasing of the the national defense uh, budget as quickly as possible. Right? Yeah, mm. yeah. And okay. I think, although this sentiment isn't very strong right now, uh, you will probably begin to hear it as we approach the. Um, the upper house elections, or maybe afterwards, if if something happens during the the elections, or if um, if for example South uh, North Korea launches some more missiles, this sentiment of you know we didn't even write this constitution. This is not our constitution. Somebody else wrote this for us. So it's time for us to, to for the Japanese to come together and really publish our own constitution. Um, that is not um, you don't you don't hear that very very often. Um, but I think that is something else that will come up because, um, yeah, there is insecurity with reliance on the United States. They're sitting right looking at the, the teeth of the dragon right here in Japan. Um, and there, there are only a couple of things that you can do about that. And I think uh, given politics and what the, uh, the LDP has said, what Ishin has said, they do want to revise the Constitution. It has never been revised. So once you open that door, it could it could begin to to tumble into something that becomes <clears throat> you know, really purely a Japanese document. Uh, and some people are in favor of that. And, you know, why not? It's it's their country. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you, Maya, for giving me so much time. Thank you. Thank you, Ren. Uh, we have Yuka. Thank you. Uh, Timothy, uh, congrats on your uh, award. Thank you uh, very much. You must be a proud daddy. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so my question is, um, you know, this, uh, the uh, Tokyo Assembly member, uh, Ms. Kinoshita, resigned, I think it's last week. Um, you know, I think Fumiko. she called. Huh? Yes, Fumiko. G yeah, Kinoshita, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, see, um, I, my question is not, you know, because she resigned or she should have or uh, none of those. My question is actually timing. What I've heard is she was a tremendous pressure under the tremendous pressure to resign. I mean, I mean, she was driving with expired license and she had caused some accident, right? Um, so, but then the reason she had held off uh, giving resignation is because if she had resigned a month earlier, uh, there was a run-up member. Oh. Can you hear me? Okay, run-up member uh, who was actually LDP member, uh, he could have uh, filled the uh, vacant position now because it had uh, kind of the uh, not those like a uh, you know like a what like a uh, like a not the specific period uh, went beyond the allowed time. That's why that the the position 
vacated by her remained vacant. Is that right? Is that is that why she resigned when she resigned? Well, this was kind of rumor. What is your take on that? Thanks. Great. That's a great question. We've dealt with this before when they are when there are by elections. So if <clears throat> if somebody uh, dies in office or they're arrested or they resign or something like that, um, there is a certain uh, period of time where they must have the election. So uh, for a period of time, maybe three months, 90 days, um, th that seat might remain open. And then at a regular cycle, it's time for by-elections. So every once in a while, you'll have by-elections. And it might be two or three people in various regions of, of Japan where the, the by-elections are held on that Sunday. So they coalesce them then. So <clears throat> what she was doing was forestalling him his opportunity to be elected so that he fell into the longer category. So that gives uh, her, her party uh, the time to groom a, a better candidate to swoop in and take that position rather than just surrender it to the LDP because uh, she got into trouble. But that's, that's something that happens pretty frequently. I hope that's somewhat responsive. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. So there was a strategy behind that. Then okay. So they were they were okay. Like uh, you said, it, they were grooming yeah. next good candidate. Okay. I and mean, you said that happens a lot. Yes, it does. So it, it's kind of sleazy, but okay. I guess that's what they do. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, the, the other th interesting thing about her uh, her situation is, in the first um, press release or uh, press conference that she had about you know, driving without a license, and maybe some people can forgive that, and she's already a member of the parliament, whatever. Um, she, she, her demeanor and the way she dressed, it was uh, very, um, you know, give, give me a second chance because it was, you know, I didn't, I didn't kill anybody, and I wasn't even arrested for the crime. It was just a violation, even though I lied to people and I told them that, you know, I, I had the license or, or whatever. Um, and then in the, the press conference last last week when she actually did resign uh, she looked terrible she looked like she had been through the ringer uh, she didn't have you know uh, the, the makeup was different her she had no jewelry on she was dressed very somberly so you, you can imagine this was a yeah a pretty pretty big deal for her and you, you go from being something of I don't mean this in a derogatory way something like a housewife into being a member of parliament you know you're swimming in money you're comparatively you're swimming in money and you're you're not riding a motorcycle anymore you're it wasn't even a motorcycle. It was just a, a, a what would you call it? A car, a, um, a scooter, um, you know, and now she's got a chauffeur and, and that, that sort of thing. So it is, it is a hard thing to give up and only because you, you made a stupid, silly mistake by not getting your driver's license renewed. It is, Japanese politics is interesting to watch. Okay, all right, thank you. I have a question uh, from uh, Hiroaki. So actually a couple of questions. So Timothy, uh, please listen carefully. So the first, uh, oh. <laughs> yes, we start with, so uh, Prime Minister Kishida mentioned that all options will be on the table, including the idea of giving the self-defense forces the capability to strike uh, at hostile enemy bases yesterday. So what do you think, what kind of options or capabilities did he refer to? And what, what kind of options or capabilities are discussed, examined, examined right now in Japan, and if possible in the US, uh, on the US side? So uh, we continue. As you know, Prime Minister Kishida is very active on nuclear arms control and disarmament diplomacy. So how can he balance between the strike capability, national security, disarmament policy, and the US-Japan alliance relationship? Okay, that's a <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, by law, Japan cannot have any offensive capabilities, and even if their capabilities could be considered to be dual use, um, they get high, a high degree of scrutiny. So even dual use, it could be used offensively, it could use be used defensively. Those uh, receive a high scrutiny. So typically, what they do is they rely on the United States to be the offensive capability because it it doesn't have anything to do with with the Japanese self-defense. And in fact, one of the reasons why they want to change the constitution is because under a certain interpretation of the constitution, the Japan's self-defense forces are unconstitutional. So that's one of the, the big issues. And, you know, for people that, that live here, um, you, you see so little in public about the Japanese uh, self-defense forces. 
um, they're, they're a bit muted in terms of uh, publicity and visibility. You see them when there's like a, a disaster, when the, for example, the, the mud flow in um, Atami or um, in some of these, uh, the floods that happened in, in Kyushu, you see them out in force there, but otherwise you rarely see them in, um, in, in public. You don't see uh, self-defense forces, strangely enough, ever walking around in uniform. So the people who, who work in self-defense forces, they basically wear their civilian clothes when they go into the office at the defense ministry, and then they change into their military wear at the defense ministry. And typically it's, it's uh, civilian clothes outside. And part of that is because, um, yeah, there's this question about the self-defense forces and this, um, this uh, negative inference that's made to people about you know their their decision to to make a career uh, with the self defense forces, so so they want to remove that stigma, um, and part of that is is addressing the the constitution constitutionality of Japan's right to defend itself. So defense is, seems to be okay in, in all of the agreements with the United States and Japan. Japan can come to the aid of the United States should they be under attack. Um, they can be um, involved in um, supply and and um, uh, support. Uh, but getting in the line of fire is uh, distinctly um, not something that the, the Japanese public or the um, the Constitution would uh, uh, provide for on an offensive capability. So um, this this statement that uh, the United that Japan is going to be in a position to do that, I think, is um, it's a little bit premature um, because it, it is not it's not allowed in the Constitution, and I I don't think that they have the offensive capabilities. They don't have an, even a marine force for uh, landing or for um, in, encroaching on, um, you know, uh, forces that might be in a position to attack Japan. So uh, that's a pretty big question. I don't know if it uh, appropriately ad addresses the question, but it's a it's a huge question. Right. And then uh, we have uh, another question from Hiroaki. So which is what do you think of an option of rebuilding a post Intermediate range nuclear force treaty, which includes China. What kind of role Japan can play for stabilizing the U.S. China relationship? Um, well, that's that's way beyond me. <laughs> right. Well, that's uh, um, even even the the idea. The yeah, I I, I think yeah, maybe um, Hiroaki, please please um, listen into. Uh, Dr. Nagy's um, report on on Monday night. I think that's more in his valley, but that's a huge question. I, I think it's it's far beyond the the, the reach of, of this particular uh, briefing. Sorry, hey, hey, Tim, uh, Maya Timothy, can I add an, a, a few spices Please to do. what Timothy yes. said a few minutes ago? Yes. About the uh, um, uh, Timothy, did you know? Uh, I'm sure this is correct, but uh, if the national uh, how do you call that in English? Uh, National Defense Force? Self-Defense Force. Self-Defense Force, yes. When they had to deal with a uh, crisis, um, when the traffic light is red, they still have to stop. Because Japan does not have a law to have a special situation for the Self-Defense Force. So they actually, I'm sure when the situation gets tough, they will have to, you know, run, uh, run over the red light to do the right things, but technically speaking, they are breaking the law. So, this, so that's, a, that's just to show how, how serious Japan is, is in, in, in dealing with the real crisis, in, ter in addition to the constitution stuff that you mentioned. So just wanted to add a few spice to your meat. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, um, thank you very much for that, Ren. That um, applies also to the Japanese police so the Japanese police um, uh, must follow the J Japanese um, traffic rules as well. Although sometimes you see them uh, blasting through uh, intersections with lights blaring and stuff like that. Um, there are certain rules and regulations to it, but for a car, a patrol car um, to approach an intersection, you know, you'll have, you'll have some, I've, I've seen it, um, you know, somebody jump out of the car because the police car's tires crossed the white line and the driver got out and he berated the, the, uh, the policeman for you know crossing the line and just yelled at him and the policeman apologized and backed his car up it was pretty funny but yeah it applies as much to the uh, the japanese uh, police and self-defense forces yeah it's it's you know this country is really a 
really funny country sometimes that the rules and regulations they're strictly adhered to and they apply to everybody <laughs> yes yes thank you thank you for i didn't know about the police things mm, that's yeah that's that's like additional spice to my spice thank you yeah and and one of the other things that um mr kishida wants to address by um uh by the the uh, extraordinary diet session is the ability of the central government to enforce pandemic um, rules and regulations, which he's not he's not constitutionally able to do. Some of the powers that uh, reside within uh, the governors is not uh, something that he can encroach upon, and he would like to address that too. So this this tug of war is it's constant, it's never ending, and always those people who have power want a little bit more and they don't want to relinquish any of it so there's it's always a, a tough battle and that's why um yeah that's why politics is so uh ugly to watch when it's on, on the you know the cutting room floor um but it's interesting to talk about when we're at this level yeah grinding the sausage right <laughs> exactly exactly yes but i believe that um, because of what we have at the moment and the government cannot encroach on uh, let's say liberty civil liberties here uh, a lot of uh, people actually have been able to maintain uh, some, let's say, semblance of normality du uh, during the pandemic. And uh, I hear this, you know, uh, from a lot of foreigners here in Japan. So there is certainly something, as you say, you know, uh, the people in power, they want to get a little bit more. And then uh, the population is not very happy with giving that a little bit more. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we did run into to a couple of problems with uh, the central government wanting to be a little bit more aggressive in closing down um, eateries and the consumption of alcohol uh, and, and things like that. There was a, a lot of tension, so they began to block different um, uh, prefectures together mm -hmm. and uh, include them in a state of emergency. And once it's a state of emergency, then the central government has uh, uh, expansive powers. But if it doesn't have the the state of emergency. That's how many of the prefectures were able to escape um, the the heavy hand of, of the central government. But that's that's part of it. And I think the you know the, the cabinet office would certainly like to have that ability to um, dictate and to control without having to jump through all of the hoops and and you know waste. I don't know if waste is the right word, but waste all of the time to get to that result. And in the meantime, the damage that they've been trying to avoid is is occurring. It must be so frustrating. But yeah, it's. Um, it's the push and pull of, you know, politics and uh, and civil liberties. Absolutely. Yes, and it is also interesting because, uh, well, among in Kasumigaseki, there is that perception that uh, the local governments, the regional governments, uh, are well, you know, they usually have different depending on the situation. Um, they appreciate uh, the powers of the central government in different ways. So sometimes they try to benefit from it. Sometimes they are. Uh, one hundred percent against it. So that's also um, another, I think, another topic uh, which could be talked about a lot, uh, probably at a different time. Not, not exactly today, but still. No, you're right, and and also there's always money tied to it. So the central government uh, collects uh, taxes from um, the various regions and also uh, relinquishes uh, dirt, certain funds for um, projects and and um, initiatives. Uh, to, to certain prefectures and some of them get more than others and it's as a consequence of you know how 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 well they played the game how close they are to you know who is the current um, click that's in in power you know there is that distribution that goes on there so and once again you know the 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 most I don't know pitiful of all prefectures has got to be Okinawa because as wonderful and as as unique as that place is the highest birth rate the lowest death rate the oldest uh, number of of people, uh, I'm sorry. Did I say that right? The the largest number of old people, old really old aging people. people let's say. Yeah, it has so many attributes to it. But boy, is it is it you know it's the the least economically viable of all of the prefectures, and it just it always gets a a, a bad rap with the central government. Um, the current governor has refused the central government's uh, request to expand uh, the um, the uh, U.S. military base. The acquisition of, of more land there because of the uh, degradation it does to the the environment down there but there, that fight continues to go on and as a result you know they don't get their fair shake either so it's a it's an interesting tug of war yes it is indeed and i also wonder because uh, it looks like 
uh, well, there is definitely a change uh, in course. Uh, as uh, well, with regards to the uh, defense budget and uh, first strike capabilities, of course, I'm going back uh, to well, the defense budget, but uh, well, it probably ties up somehow, you know, to uh, the talk of Okinawa. It's like we knew that uh, Kishida and his faction, uh, they were basically known as, you know, a politicians who are not very keen on, um, let's say, enhancing those capabilities of Japan. But now they're talking about uh, in the increase of uh, defense budget. They're talking about uh, actually allowing, you know, uh, that first strike capability uh, through a change in the constitution. Of course, we cannot see that happen uh, soon but still it's on somewhere uh, on the table so i just wonder because uh, we have known that uh, within the the ldp there there's always you know the uh, uh far far right wing and also the well people like politicians like kishida and now it looks like the party as a whole is moving in um, in a different direction in the direction more right direction if i can say so and I wonder yeah. how this is going to play out in the long yeah, run. That's, yeah, that's really, really interesting, Maya. I think people in this room just, you should key off of that word, first strike capability. So revising the Constitution is one thing. Uh, giving the central government different powers to um, uh, have control over um, maybe pandemic or other kinds of situations uh, that happen in, in the country or increasing the defense budget or having a, an acknowledgement of the uh, self-defense forces and maybe they change the name of it because if they if if they actually have that ability to to do that then why should it be called the self-defense forces it kind of it enhances the fact that we are we are only for defensive capabilities why don't we just say it's the the defense ministry Indeed. but that's a very very different issue than first strike first strike is that's the ultimate um, uh, technology that, that you want to have. That's something that is viable and protected from, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, attack or, or, or damage. Uh, uh, first strike is is huge. I don't know if um, if that's even uh, something that the Japanese would want their uh, capabilities to have. I, I, and that's just a huge issue. So just keep your eye out when you're listening or, or reading um, documents or, or newspapers. Keep your eye out for that word because that's a that's a, a very emotionally loaded word. It is indeed because um, with I would say with everybody I have talked with so far, everybody is against that changing uh, the const not only the constitution again, but of course I don't talk with politicians. So <laughs> obviously but, there's um, a divide between what the general population feels strong about and the politicians. And sorry to yeah. interrupt you. Maya, about that point, um, uh, I guess the question to, to Timothy is, is it is it safe to assume that the only opposing party that may go along with uh, Jiminto is uh, Ishino, uh, Osaka Ishin, mm -hmm. and uh, and you actually you haven't mentioned about Osaka Ishin uh, uh, today. Uh, they have become the third largest uh, party, right? Is that right? Third largest, yeah. Um, any any view on them, uh, Timothy, or uh, any? Kitai in Japanese we call it Kitai, right? Expectation right. how they can uh, contribute to or, or creating a positive wave. Any comment about them? I'll, I'll be curious to know what you think about them. In so, addition to yeah, go ahead. So first of all, the um, uh, the number of politicians who are in favor of revising the constitution is now far more um, expansive than what is constitutionally required. Constitutionally, it is required that uh, two thirds of the upper house, two thirds of the lower house, vote for this referendum, and then the referendum is brought to the Japanese population. And of the population who decides to vote, of fifty percent of those who decide to vote, if they vote for that referendum, then then they can start working on uh, re uh, revising the constitution. And as it stands right now. Ishin is for revision. LDP is for revision. Komeito has said that they would uh, go along with revision uh, with, because they're a coalition partner with the LDP, um, given certain caveats, obviously. Ishin is for 
Um, and the Constitutional Democratic Party has come out because of the four candidates have all said publicly that they are for revising the Constitution in this way and in that way. So they're not saying the Constitution uh, revision is, is out of the question. They're actually um, promoting it for certain areas, although everybody has their own pet is issue. But certainly with the LDP, with Ishin, with um, uh, I, not, not so much Komeito, but uh, the revision of the Constitution with regard to uh, the self-defense forces is a huge issue for the LDP. So um, there, there are other, uh, you know, this Constitutional Revision Committee has been in um, existence for, for maybe 25 years. Um, the fellow who hired me out of law school was the chairman of it. So I've, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with the, the initiatives and how long it's been going in session. Um, and it's also included um, other other parties in discussions. So many of these discussions have been on hiatus for a long time as a as a consequence of being mad at the LDP for this or that. And we're not going to talk about constitutional revision because we know you want to talk about it, but we're mad at you because of this and that. So if you fix those things, then maybe we'll have this con conversation with you. So that is that has been going on. Those talks have reinitiated. Uh, I think they've had two talks since um, the Sub administration. So it is making a little bit of, of headway. But to talk about Ishin, Ishin is uh, now 41 um, members of the Diet. It is the third largest um, uh, opposition. It's not an opposition. It's the third largest uh, political party. Um, and I think that they're going to start making great inroads. They're in a great position to do something with the, um, the upper house in in seven months. And plus, they've done such a great job, and they're so regional. They're, they're mostly in um, the Kansai district, uh, there's a little bit going on here in Tokyo and also in uh, Tokyo uh, metropolitan politics. So I think they're poised to make a, a real play. They don't have many negatives. Uh, they've got a lot of positives. And the Japanese population, when polled, has said, we would like to have a third force. We have the, uh, the LDP Komeito uh, coalition, um, but we don't have a viable opposition party. We've got the Constitutional Democratic Party, but they're not very... Um, effective, apparently. You've got the Communist Party, but we would like to see a viable, you know, counterpoint to what the LDP comes up with. And um, I think uh, Ishin fills that that uh, role, um, even just right out of the shoot. It, it's just beginning to to get traction. But, you know, it's I don't think it's a flash in the pan. I think they're going to do extremely well in the upper house as well. Yeah, I have one Thank more you. question. Uh, from uh, Hiroaki. Ah. So the question is, is it still difficult for Japan under the current constitution by utilizing US-2, supporting transportation of the US's military staff and supplies, specifically in the case of Taiwan's trade? That issue has been resolved. Japan is in support logistics. So um, we saw that in Sudan um, and in um, many of the operations um, about six, seven years ago. Um, and so uh, that issue has been basically uh, resolved that in support of U.S. efforts, as long as it's not in the direct line of fire. Right. Okay. Good. And uh, so we seem to have exhausted the questions. Maya, you said, maybe I said I was, I was kind of occupied. I was in an event, but um this having this briefing is is really important and, and doing it consistently is um is important too so even though i was conflicted with an event i did uh, this room while i was participating in the event and we just talked briefly about the the car event in akalenga yes. and there were about seven people in this room that actually showed up at akalenga on sunday and i just want to say you know thank you to those people who um who took the time and and came out to um to Yokohama to um, participate and to see see what was going on and to take the time to come out and, and find me and say hi hi Mr Langley hi Timothy how you doing and um, please tell me about you know the, these cars that are all collected here and this piece of junk that you're driving so it was great fun and I think it was triggered by um, you bringing that up my last week so thank you very much and thanks everybody who came out congratulations once again on your car winning the prize of the year car of the year prize so unbelievable. Yes, I really would love to see that, uh, you know, that prize somewhere on your social media accounts. So Yeah, I haven't posted it yet. I haven't had the time to kind of come up with um, a nice way of, of doing it. But uh, yeah, I, I should post it because it's pretty, pretty outstanding. 
Yes, and also if you somebody made a big mistake. <laughs> it was a great event, sixty cars. Um, you know, more than four thousand people kind of milled by and um, you know took a look at it. Nobody kicked the tires. You're not supposed to do that, but um, it was a yeah, it was a very successful event. We do it annually, and it was um, it was a beautiful day, nice and sunny. We we do events, um, maybe six events throughout the year. So this is the one in Akalengo. We also have one at um, in Daikanyama. There's a, uh, a a Starbucks there that has a huge parking lot. Mm -hmm. What's the name of that? T Square or something like that. Um, have a nice library like um, uh, Starbucks there, um, and they have a big parking lot in the back. And um, we take over that parking lot um, on a weekend. Uh, sometime during the spring, but there there are other events around if people are interested in those kinds of things. So you're going to tell us about them in advance, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yes. This was Japan Expert Insights Room on Japanese politics. Thank you for coming and staying with us today. We will be on air next Sunday at 8.30 in the morning, Japan time again, so join us. Until then, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and the role of Japan in the Indo-Pacific region. If you want to stay informed about our upcoming events, you can follow us on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Again, we're looking forward to your joining us next week. Until then, stay well and enjoy every day as much as possible. See you.